may be seated. It is great to see you today and great to have you here worshiping with us. We're continuing to study the book of Mark. We've been in Mark since January. It has always been my conviction that every Christian needs to have a working knowledge of one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, doesn't matter which one, but as long as you have a working knowledge, you can begin to access and understand the message of Jesus Christ. Now from there, I hope you become a student of the whole Bible, but having a working knowledge of the gospel is the primary task that we have as Christians. And so that's why we've been working through it slowly. And we've been going from the first of the book of Mark. Now Mark, as you know, is a very different than the rest of them. What Jesus is doing in Mark is beginning to unveil himself. Mark shows us slowly who Jesus is, and it comes to a crescendo today. Now, as we see that, we see it going slowly. Matthew's very different. He starts at a different place than Mark. He starts with a genealogy. He wants to tell those who were, uh, who were Jewish that uh, he had the right credentials, if you will, and he starts there. But Luke, Luke's in a very different place. Luke wants to show you this birth story, and so he starts with the story that we read every Christmas. John, John from the very beginning tells us who Jesus is, and then he goes back in to show us who Jesus is. Not so Mark. Where John starts, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he begins to point directly at Jesus. Mark starts slowly. Mark starts, for instance, in Jesus' adult life. We don't see any of his childhood. We don't see any of the growing up. We don't see any of the birth narrative. We don't see any of that kind of stuff. He starts slowly, and he, he, he shows this man who comes out of Nazareth and is baptized by John in the Jordan. As soon as he comes out of that, he's taken into the desert, and there he undergoes all sorts of temptations. Coming out of those temptations, he then goes in, and he chooses 12 people to surround him, we call them the disciples. And we watch over the disciples' shoulders as he begins to work with them as well as the crowds. And we see it because it's a fascinating journey of leadership as he begins to teach them and begin to grow them. And we begin to understand that because oftentimes we're called disciples of Jesus if we're a follower of Jesus. And so we pay special attention to that which he tells the disciples and there he begins to grow them slowly just by showing them First, he just says, come and see. And then, of course, he makes the bigger step where he says, come and follow me. And when they follow him, they begin to see that Jesus has command over the demonic, that Jesus has power over the physical body and his healing touch. He has power over nature as well. And they begin to watch all this. At some point, they get overwhelmed and they sit in a boat when Jesus does some miracle and they go, get away from me, right? because they are aware of themselves, not just Jesus. And that's what happens when we encounter Jesus. We also become very aware of ourselves and who we are. And that's really an amazing thing that happens in the Gospels when we look, because that's what it shows us. So he does all these miracles, very little teaching in the book of, John, uh, book of Mark. If you want to go for teaching, go to the book of Matthew. Matthew's built around five different sermons with action in between, but that's where you will get the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, the you are's, you are salt, you are light, the, the, the it is said, but I say stuff. That all comes out of the book of Matthew, not out of Mark. In fact, the only teaching in the book of Mark is in chapter four, and it's a series of parables, and all of them are horticultural parables. And I didn't do that on purpose, but I wanted you to know those parables, and so we talked about those things, right? And as you work through there, then you come to this point where the disciples now go on a bit of a vacation, if you will, to a place called Caesarea Philippi. So I would love for you to turn in your Bibles. We're going to be in Mark chapter 8. We're going to begin with verse 27. And if you will, follow along with me as we begin to read this important of passages. It says this, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked a simple question. In other words, they're just walking, he's chatting, they got time. Who do you say that I am? He asked an identity question. 
Well, let's stop right there because I know that we've been talking a lot about geography and I don't want to leave you hanging on this because he's never been to Caesarea Philippi before. I want you to look at the map. We've been talking about this map a lot. We talk about this is the nation of Israel and there is a rift that goes down the middle of it. It goes all the way down in Africa. It's where two plates come together. Those of you who are geologists know that everything on the right side has a lot of oil and the left side doesn't have a lot of oil. Uh, Israel kind of isn't there. In fact, many people in uh, Houston when I was serving down there thought, why in the world they call that the promised land if there's no oil, right? (laughs) And yet they do. But there in the promised land, Jesus ministered. You'll see in the bottom half of that is the Dead Sea, way below sea level, very salty. But in the northern half is the Sea of Galilee, the lowest freshwater lake on earth. And it's there, and it's combined by the Jordan River. Most of the ministry of Jesus takes place in that northern part around the Sea of Galilee. But here he begins to go far afield. First, two weeks ago, we went to Tyre and Sidon. You remember the Syrophoenician lady who was there? He went outside the Jewish world into a very Gentile world. He ministered there. Now he comes back to the Sea of Galilee. He went to the Decapolis, and now he goes up to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is a very high point right at the base of Mount Hermon up there. Again, it's on one side of the rift. And on the right-hand side of the rift, Jesus would have gone up there. And we don't really know why he went up there. All we know is he asked an important question on the way up there. For those of you who are following along even today, because I know many of you pay attention to Israel of the day, this is called the Golan Heights. That's what you would have heard it about. And the Golan Heights was the place in 1973 that Israel wanted badly to take it over because Syria and Jordan could look down into the valley and command the whole place. Well, Jesus' disciples are just going up there. Doesn't say why they're going up there. The reason we know this story is because of this question. Who do you say that I am? And he asked it really in the third person on purpose. Because it's not so invasive. People don't have to think. They're basically saying, Who do the people you hang out with say that Jesus is? And the reality is everybody has an opinion about Jesus. You have an opinion, the people you hang out with, the people you play golf with, everybody has an opinion about Jesus. There's nobody in the American culture that won't have some opinion about Jesus. If you ask him this question at work, who do people say that Jesus is? They will tell you. And they might tell you he's a moral teacher. They might tell you he was a spiritual leader. They might tell you he was crazy. They might tell you all sorts of things. But this is the real critical question for there. The disciples, in thinking about it, replied like this. Well, some say John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? He's the one that was beheaded. Sort of weird that they would say that. I mean, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. I don't know what was going on in their minds at that point. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. You remember the Old Testament prophet who, who did a lot of miracles as well. So a lot of people thought, well, that's what Jesus is like. Maybe it's Elijah come back. Others would say one of the prophets. And so they go through this whole list of things that people say that Jesus is. You might want to just stop for a second and say, if you went to your office or to your soccer field or wherever you find yourself uh, and ask the people around you, if you were bold enough, who would they say that I am? Well, now it gets very personal and they ask a particular question and the particular question is this. Who, who do you say that I am? You see, up until that point, there's not much commitment, right? For me to speak for everybody else, takes no personal commitment at all. But he's asking people who have been with him. In fact, the whole ministry up in the Sea of Galilee, they've watched him. And Jesus now begins very pointed to say, who do you say that I am? He's curious about what they have discerned from all that they've seen. And Jesus uh, asks that, and Peter answers first. No supplies there. Peter is always answering first. He's the one that jumps in there. He's one of my favorite Bible characters because whenever he opens his mouth, he inserts his foot, and uh, I relate to that a great deal, right? And Peter answers him and says, you are the Christ. 
In the NIV, it says, you are the Messiah. The one who is foretold, the one who is, the one who is breaking into time and space to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. You are the one who is to come. Now, at this point, they didn't understand the fullness of what that answer would say, but you are the Christ. In Matthew, it says this, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then it goes on to say, blessed are you, Peter, Simon, Barjona, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but instead, this comes from heaven. And he goes on to this long thing, Mark, real spare, you are the Messiah. But that answer, that answer changes everything. Because once you're asked that question, how you respond to it makes a big difference in how you live. Because if your answer is you are the Christ, the Messiah, then it is no longer a neutral point. You see, if we say you're a great human rights teacher, we can just let him do his thing and totally ignore it. If we say uh, you were a good man, you could say, well, I know other good men, so that's great. Good for you. Yeah. And you could go down the list of all the things that are sort of benign in nature. But when he says you are the Messiah, it changes all the whole game. And Peter answered him in that way. You know, if you were to join the, the Lakeway Church, there are three questions we ask you. There really, of those three questions, there's one affirmation and there's two commitments, okay? Here they are. The first one is an affirmation of faith. It's the first question is this, do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Now, in answering that question, it's packed, right? First of all, there's a trust level in there and it's not a trust that has anything to do with the particular of the Lakeway Church, it's really a trust question, which is an affirmation question. I affirm that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Two things. And see, that's really, really important because when Jesus is Lord, it means that nobody else is. Okay? Nobody else takes precedent. Nobody else has first and primary place. We, everything else falls into secondary place. When Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, even my marriage falls underneath it. So does my work. So does my political party. Jesus is my Lord. And he's my Savior. And he does for me what I cannot do for myself. You see, because what I've recognized and what the disciples had recognized is that our brokenness is too great. We cannot pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. It is God who intervenes to solve that which we cannot solve for ourselves. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, we are more broken and sinful than we dare to believe. And yet at the same time, we are more accepted and loved by God and Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. We're more broken and sinful than we ever dared believe, but we are more accepted and loved by God and Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. You are the Messiah and you're my Lord and you're my Savior. You see, how we answer that question, who do you say that I am, is really important. It's the first question of membership. Second question is, will you be his disciple and obey his word and show his love? In other words, will you live under his lordship and obey his word and then show his love? Will it live itself out in love? Will I choose, for instance, uh, instead of vengeance, I will choose love? See, in Matthew, when he taught... He said this, you have heard it said that you are to love your neighbor, but I say you are to love your what? Do you know? Enemies. Have you ever tried to do that on your own? I have. It does not work. It doesn't. I I tell you what, try and follow Jesus' words at that point under your own power. If you want to, knock yourself out. But he gave them a new way of life. And so we ask that question, will you be his disciple and obey his word and show his love? 
Third question is, will you be a, a faithful member of the Lakeway Church involving yourself in our life together with your time and your talents and your treasures, right? So I had a guy a number of years ago come in and he wanted to talk about membership. And so I gave him those three questions and he goes, well, I can answer number three unequivocally, yes. Number two, maybe, right? Number one, no. I just haven't gotten there with Jesus. And then he asked me, can I still join? And I said, no. And he said, you didn't hear me. I'm going to give you my tithe, okay? I'm going to write the check. And then I thought, hmm, maybe, no. <laughs> because the last two follow from the first one. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That is a primary question, and it is a question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? And in answering it, it changes everything. It changes everything. He goes on then after this um, in verse 30, and it said, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him, which is just sort of this marking sort of thing that happens. Be quiet, don't tell, all that kind of stuff. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. In other words, they answer him correctly and all of a sudden Jesus goes dark on them, right? It says this in 32, he spoke plainly about this, but then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He came and said, oh, Jesus, come over here for a second. You're scaring the children, okay? <laughs> I mean, that's essentially what it is. It's in the Greek, so I know you can't read it, so I'm going to... You're scaring the children. That's what he says. He begins to rebuke him because he's going dark on him. He's talking about death and the whole deal and being betrayed and things like that. But Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter. and He said, get behind me, Satan. Now, this is the same language that you're going to see in the temptations as well. You remember when the temptations, when Jesus was offered by Satan, the whole world, he said, you can have all power. You can have everything. Whatever you want to do, you can have it if you just turn and worship me, right? And now he turns to Peter, his friend, and says, stop it. Stop it. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. And then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, you see, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Did you notice that? There's a little change here. We're halfway through the book of Mark and it started with the admonition that they follow him and now he adds two things to it. And he said, okay, we're at this point. I want you to know that from here on out, to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, you must take up your cross, and you must follow me. He just ramps it up a little. You so to deny yourself means that we put ourselves under the Lordship of Jesus. And those very things that I want to do may not fit within his plans that I say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done which is at the essence of following him. Have you ever considered that? As you begin to make a decision about who Jesus is for you, you ask that question. If you say he is my Lord and Savior, we say he is indeed Lord. And he takes that on. And I have to deny myself because there are times when I want, we'll go back to the earlier illustration, I want revenge on somebody who has hurt me. And it's everything in my power wants revenge. And Jesus says, you're called to learn how to love them. And I say, not my will, but thy will be done in my life. 
And that only happens when we begin to understand the call of discipleship. Up until this point, all eight chapters, you have not heard any of this. And now he begins to ramp it up and he basically gives them an opt-out clause, right? I said, follow me and you could have done this all the way along. Let me tell you what the new requirements are. You can opt out if you want. You know, we know that because of John chapter six, there's a time in John chapter six where Jesus begins to preach about discipleship and at the end of it, a whole bunch of people in the crowd leave. And they're like, this isn't really what I was in for. You know, I just kind of wanted some place to go on Sunday some place to dress up a little bit. I'm beginning to like your coffee. It's better than the Folgers. What was that about, you know? And we, we get to that point and he gets an opt-out clause and all these people left in John chapter six. And the interesting thing is, Jesus didn't turn to his disciples and say, please stay, please stay, this will all get better. He didn't say that, right? And I know at that moment, because he didn't say that, he had never been in youth ministry. <laughs> I was a youth minister for 18 years, and we would do anything to get kids there. You get 100 kids, I'll eat a goldfish, right? Or, you know, let's, we'll smear whipped cream on every part of our bodies. I don't know what you do with it. You know, whatever it takes to get you here, that's great. Jesus is turning to the crowd. Half of them are leaving. He's going, why don't you go too? I'm thinking, Jesus, we need a little more training here, brother. And then his disciples say this, to whom do we go? Only you have the words of life. You see, once you've discovered that, you discover something powerful because then he goes in and says this, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. We've seen that happen over and over and over again, even with our friends. And whoever wants to lose his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it that someone gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose their life for me will save it. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before you see that kingdom of God has come with power. And that's true because after his death and resurrection on Pentecost, they saw the world transformed upside down by these disciples who began to decide at this point, do I opt? opt in or out out when we ask the question is Jesus who he says he is am I going to deny myself and take up my cross in order to follow him deeper call they say yes and by the time you get to the center of the book of Acts and the story of the new church the world is turning upside down this is the room where it happened Right? It all begins with an affirmation. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you are my Lord and my Savior. Have you learned that? It's one thing to come and listen to Jesus. He is a good teacher. It's another thing to listen to his healing stories and marvel at that because he was a marvel marvelous healer but at some point in all your journey he's going to turn to you and it may be in the quiet of a moment it may be some night when you just flick off the light and head to bed and you lie there and Jesus is saying who do you say that I am and your answer to it will make all the difference in the world You see, we are more broken and sinful than we ever dared believe. But in Jesus Christ, we begin to discover that we are more accepted and loved than we ever dare hope. And when we begin to say, Lord, I want to follow you and give our will over to him, 
It changes the game. The ball's in your court. I leave it to you this week. When you're out for your walk this afternoon, just imagine somebody's in your ear saying, who do you say that I am? If you're, if you're on the golf course this week and you have a moment, just think about that. If you're in a place where you're driving to work and the traffic's backed and you're stopped up, just imagine Jesus saying that. Because as you answer it, it will have transforming power by the Holy Spirit to make all the difference in the world. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter said, and it made all the difference. May it be so in your life and mine. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank you that you are a God who meets us in Jesus Christ. You tell those stories, those silly little stories about a shepherd leaving the 99 and coming after the one. And one day we look down and we realize we're the one and yet you're still coming to pick us up, to call us back to you, to make all the difference in the world. And if there's anybody here who has never responded, who has never said yes to you, Lord, I pray that this be the moment and this be the morning and this be the time and this be the place. For we realize, Lord, we're more broken and sinful than we ever dared believe and we feel that at moments, Lord. We've tried it under our own power and it does not work and yet now we understand that we are more accepted and loved by you. In Jesus Christ, who did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so, Lord, we give you our very lives, even as we pray all these things. In the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts we forgive us who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen amen church let's stand and respond together in song